Hi there. In this lecture, we're going to go back to the island of Bali and look at their painting traditions. Of the painting traditions really are something that bore out of the Lontar book tradition. Lontar is the name for a palm leaf book that is made of palm fronds that have been separated and cut into equal lengths, flattened and dried and scraped. And then to prepare these drawings, they, they um, take a metal stylus and they scratch into the surface of the palm leaf and then by sort of spreading ink over these grooves, the ink settles into the leaf. The leaf is then scraped off the surf. The ink is scraped off the surface, and what remains is the ink that's embedded in the leaf. And they sort of draw these very delicate, fine line drawings on both sides of the lontar. And as you're sort of reading this book, you can read one leaf, then kind of flip it over and read another, and then slide it down. And so this sort of connected by strings. This is the kind of book that was the way these ancient texts made their way from ancient India all the way to Java and eventually to Bali. Bali is actually one of the few places where these books still are made. And um, it is, is due to this sort of tradition that the Brahmin priests of Bali have taken on themselves to continually uh, rewrite and recreate these Lontar books. Because Lontar are fairly durable, but even in the tropics, books and things like this decay very quickly. Um, a well-made Lontar book might only last as long as 70 years. And so that to maintain a library, you have to employ a number of people to continually rework and remake these ancient texts. Another very important uh, painting tradition in Bali is the Pelilindangan, which are the ritual calendars. And these calendars are the way the Balinese understand their year is a kind of cycle of 210 days. It's slightly based like a, a lunar calendar, but the way the two calendars, it's actually two calendars sort of interacting with each other. So if you sort of start in the corner and then you count down one, two, three, four, five on the diagonal, and then when you get to the bottom, you go up to the top to the one, then down to the two, and then you slide back over to the beginning again, and you go three, four, five, and you sort of continue this sort of connection between the vertical and horizontal calendars, you can start to kind of map out um, your lunar year. Anyways, these are paintings, and they all have astrological significance uh, to the Balinese, and uh, people check these for important ritual days and events that mark their year. The style of painting that is commonly done in Bali is called the Wayang style, or it also has been called the Kemasan style. Kemasan is the name of a village where this painting tradition has been carried on for a very long time. Wayang style is, of course, a very broad term. Wayang, we know, is the name for the puppet tradition, and the paintings are a sort of direct imitation of those puppet designs. The characters in the paintings look flat, the style of the faces, uh, the decorations, a lot of the elements of the puppet theater have been brought into the painting tradition. So they have this sort of flat puppet-like articulation. Now the earth tone colors are no longer used. Um, that was only due to the fact that modern paintings, modern paints were not available. But now uh, even the most traditional of Balinese painters will use these new um, chemical-based paints. 
there's in each of these traditions a very flat background uh, with ornamental decorations. You see how the, the bushes and the trees rest right on the surface. There's no dimensionality to the paintings. And there's also text. You see those words that are beside the figure in this picture here. You see how the words are inscribed. They will be the names of the characters or important utterances that they have. And in a sense, this is a narrative tradition just like a puppet show. Now, last time I was in Bali, I had the good fortune to learn how to do uh, traditional Balinese painting. And uh, here is an example of how they kind of break it down. Uh, starting on the upper left, we see how a very precise line drawing is then to very delicate ink lines. And then the ink lines, uh, there's a very fine wash that's applied and the wash is built up, uh, creating a kind of shading or values. And then there is uh, the beginnings of color are added and then depth to the color and then shading the color and the very end uh, black is drawn in once again into the figure to give it its definition and its its clear form now here is a traditional Balinese painting done in, a, in the modern style as I say they no longer use the earth tone colors they see very vibrant blues and greens that are only possible with uh, these sort of new commercial pigments which are more permanent and last longer. Here you can see these Wyong style characters interacting. Uh, notice how the figure on the female figure on the left here how her arm is bent backwards in that sort of uh, very stylized way that was uh, sort of in characteristic of uh, the uh, idea of beauty that goes back to Borbador and Prambanan. Now let's look at a paintings that were done in the traditional style that were used as uh, decorations in a royal court. The Kirtha Gosa Pavilion at Klonkung was first built in the 18th century by the king Dewa Agong Gusti Sidaman. This building, uh, the Kirtha Gosa Pavilion, functioned as a court of law until 1945 when Indonesia gained independence and uh, more democratic institutions were established. We know that paintings were there for a number of years. The earliest records we have of paintings, though, in the pavilion only go back to the 1920s. And no one's quite sure what the pavilion had or did not have paintings prior to that. In the 1960s, it was repainted, and again in the 1990s. Today, uh, the, these are photographs I have from paintings from the 1990s. These, today, these paintings no longer exist as they've, they've been replaced in the 2000s. Here is a, a series, the first scene of a story that's played at the Kirtha Gosa Pavilion. The story is called Bhima Suwarga, which simply means Bhima goes to heaven. The main characters you see here um, are on the very far left, the two short figures, those are Twalin and Rida. Rida is the one in red, and Twalin is the one with the black checked cloth. And then Directly to the right of Twalin is Yudhisthira, and then next to Yudhisthira is his mother, Kunti. Now, Kunti on the, uh, is standing before Bhima, Arjuna, Nakula, and Sadewa. Now, these are all characters, perhaps you remember, from the Mahabharata. And what's interesting about the story Bhima Suwarga is that it, it doesn't actually exist in the Mahabharata as it's told in India. This is a story that has been created out of the tradition of the Mahabharata with the characters of the Mahabharata, but it is really a Balinese invention. And there are a number of stories like this in Wayang where the characters are used to tell other stories that the the people like to hear about. 
So in this very first uh, scene where we have uh, the great heroes of the Mahabharata, the Pandua, are meeting, they get news that their father and their other mother, Madri, their father Pandu and their other mother, Madri, have died. And at this point, they have learned through an oracle that they have been sent to hell. And of course, this is very distressing to all of them. You see their arms rest, raised in alarm as they hear this news from Kunti. And so they are um, distraught and they're not sure what to do. Bhima, the one in the center who's darker skinned with the big claws on his thumbs, he is incensed and he refuses to accept this news and he is going down to hell to free his parents and put them in heaven where they belong. And so this is the impetus for our story. Here is Bhima and the, the Punakawan marching off to hell on a beautiful sunny day. And here's this a, sort of a classic example of the sort of decorative patterns and uh, ornamental character of the sort of classic Wyong style. You see, they look energetic and uh, vital in their movement, but they're all very flat. You notice how everything sort of just hangs right on the surface. Everything fits very neatly. So on this journey to hell, Bhima and his companions um, meet with a number of scenes. This is actually one of the largest parts of the whole story. It's a whole series of scenes of people being tortured in hell. And they are tortured by various punishments uh, according to their crimes and misdemeanors. So all this sort of things. If, you, if you've noticed here, there's a, a picture here of a, a, a bull-headed uh, bath where people are being cooked. You see the demon here is tossing people into the, into the cooking water. And if you remember, we've seen a picture like this before in Bajapayat period and further back into the uh, temple of Borobudur. So this is an idea that belongs to, uh, if you remember the, the context, the story of the Maha Karma Vibhanga, which is that lowest level of Borobudur. And so it's interesting how from Borobudur to Bali, there is this connection of the Maha Karma Vibhanga. Well, Bhima finds his parents uh, but the, the demons in hell refuse to allow him to let them free. Uh, he eventually finds them and tips them out of their own uh, bull-headed um, bath and then rescues them by fighting and defeating all the demons in hell. He goes up to heaven and he, he's determined to establish his own parents in heaven, but the gods say you can't just bring any old person up to heaven. So here he is fighting off all of the gods of heaven. In this case, he's very much like Hercules, if you remember the, the, the ways he goes up and uh, challenges the gods themselves in this story. And Bhima here is sort of creating a, a big tumult. He's get, being assisted by, again, you see in the lower area, uh, the clown characters of Twalan and Brida. Bhima is actually betrayed by his father, who is the son of the wind, the god of the wind. And Bhima being the son of the wind god, uh, the, his father knows his weakness and he's able to kill him. But of course, he is rescued by none other than Sanghyang Widiwasa, who comes down and says, it's not yet time for Bhima to die. He restores him to health and Bhima goes off and he's able to establish his parents up in heaven and give them the drink of immortality so they may stay there forever. So this is how a traditional Balinese painting uh, story uh, works. With the arrival of the colonial powers and later the tourists, 
painting becomes a very important object that the Balinese use to sell to the new tourist trade. And to that end, they were given some instruction by some very important uh, European artists, a Walter Spies, a Russian, Miguel Covarrubias, a Spanish, and Rudolf Bonnet, a Dutch. These, these three artists all uh, helped the Balinese establish the Pita Maha school where they would give lessons and help them develop a style of painting that retains some of the chief characteristics of the traditional Wayang style, but also infused it with a kind of more a deeper pictorial quality. So now for the first time, there's pictorial depth. The pictures go back in space. You have a kind of a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Whereas before, everything was just sort of on the surface. And so this is a painting here, Ikutut Nindun, the flute player, which you see in the middle ground. And in the foreground, we see a tiger chasing a deer. In the background, we see more deer. So there's a sense of a sort of an idyllic paradise. And that's often the theme of these new Ubud style paintings and Bantuan style paintings. This here is what you call a Bantuan painting. It's not as colorful. It's mostly has a kind of sepia tone with a little bit more of uh, black. So it's, it's a very uh, valued judgment is black. Now here you have uh, a Ubud style. It's a little bit more colorful. Uh, this is from 1954 by Ikutut Lier, Life in Bali. Again, a kind of idyllic paradise. We're seeing uh, the temples and the everyday life of uh, people in Bali in this uh, paradise. And uh, these, of course, are really lovely paintings. They're very busy. You can see every surface is covered with some kind of decoration design leaf or something to keep it all very uh, agitated and excited. And it, it's now in the Ubud style, you can see with more color. And uh, that's sort of the, the, the goal of the Ubud style. Ubud is, is today a very important cultural center for art and painting. Here is another Ubud style painting. This is a painting in honor of the holiday, uh, Tumpak Landup by Ayn Yeoman Meja. This is done in 1952. This painting, of course, features the Balinese masks we've seen from the Toping Pajigan. Uh, we see a number of different kinds of characters, from the old man uh, to uh, the bold uh, minister and the demon character. And in the background, you'll see a Chris dagger intertwined with these two uh, snakes, or called Naga, one being more stylized and one being more naturalistic. Uh, in this painting, the holiday Tumpuk Lundup honors metals and technology and cultural wisdom. And so this painting sort of draws all those things together and places them in the foreground with a ceremonial offering to all those parts of Balinese culture which are honored on the holiday Tumpuk Lundup.